I know I owe you guys a uh, DVD Blu-ray update, and I'm working on that. I do have some things, but honestly, uh, I've got like two or three things in the works that I've been really working on to get edited. Some really cool stuff from a convention and some other things. So uh, I will have those coming pretty soon. And I was just looking for something that kind of motivated me to do a quick video. And uh, it came up today, uh, Travis from Planet Beer Wagon did his top five uh, 80s horror movies. And I'll put a link to that below, and this will be a direct video response to that. Uh, as you guys know, Travis does a lot of things. He doesn't always do like just direct uh, movie-related stuff or top list, but when he does, I always enjoy watching those, and I'm always kind of excited um, to see what I think of those lists and to see how I would compare to lists of my own. And he's one of those people that doesn't do a lot of horror-related things, even though he's, you know, he is a fan of horror-related movies. Uh, but it's just, you know, I mean, everybody has their own niche, and he does all kinds of things. He doesn't really, you know, focus on just one type of movie, which is great. That's what I like about him. His top five list is actually so close to what I would have chosen for the top five um, 80s uh, horror movies that I've just decided what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add to that. And just randomly, that's how it came up. I'm going to add five more. If you guys um, would like to do a video response to this and add five more of yours, we could just continue this like a chain. Just somebody else add five more movies that haven't been used in the other two. Uh, Travis, um, he did his on Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Poltergeist, American Werewolf in London, uh, Evil Dead 2, and... Um, Creep Show 2, which are all great. Uh, I would actually probably have chosen most of those, especially in like a top 20. I would have for sure chosen all those. As for a top 10, I definitely would have chosen, I think, all of those except for maybe one. And top five would have been about, you know, four out of the five, maybe three out of the five. So what I'm doing here is I'm just adding five more. This isn't necessarily my top five as much as it is five more that I would have had top of that list because I just feel like I don't want to duplicate what Travis has already done. Uh, and these are in no particular order, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about each movie and how it affected me because there are a lot of 80s horror movies I enjoy. These are mostly ones that really just got underneath my skin. And Travis told a really great story about how he um, how he learned about Evil Dead 2 and then what kind of effect it had on him. And then later, you know, he watched it some more, but how it really kind of spooked him. Most of these movies here did the same thing to me, and it's kind of late here at night, and I'm by myself. So hopefully this doesn't <laughs> just create nightmares for me, but whatever the case may be. Uh, this first one I want to talk about, it's one that I can't exactly remember the first time I saw it. I do remember that it was um, probably, when it, this movie was probably still pretty new. It might have been a newer release on VHS, but I do remember renting this movie. Uh, it came out in 86, and I think we, my buddy and I rented it about 1988, so it would have been fairly new. And then after that, I rented it a couple more times just so I could try to scare other people just because the beginning of this really kind of just got to me. And a lot of people don't talk about this movie. Um, and it is Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Um, this movie here has a really interesting beginning. That's the part that really affected me the most. Uh, this movie as a whole, as I watched it, you know, over the years, the the beginning is the one that really still kind of seems to stand out. And it's because the movie takes on a different approach than the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, at the time I saw this, I don't even know if I really remember Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the first one, that well. But the beginning of this starts off with two guys in a little car, and they're driving from Oklahoma to Texas for OU Texas weekend. And where I grew up, and that's a big thing around here, it just always stuck. And then I started watching that, and I started really getting into the movie thinking, man, this is just like they're telling a story about something local. And then it just kind of started getting crazy. And uh, there's kind of like, um, oh, like what you would say, like The Duel or another uh, movie like that where you get into like two cars. And then you get to see what's in the other car and... It's just, it's hard to describe 
why this movie to me is such a scary movie for the beginning, but to me, it always just kind of spooked me the idea that somebody in a car could just start coming after you because to me that seems so real. So that's the reason I picked Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. That movie still kind of gets to me. Uh, the next one I'm talking about is one that really isn't that scary to me now, but when I was a kid, really messed me up. <laughs> and that's Return of the Living Dead. Uh, this movie here in particular, I remember watching when I was really young. It was really late, and it was on cable. And um, I think I was the only one still awake. Everybody had gone to bed. And it was one of those weird things where you're in the living room watching a movie, and then it becomes apparent that you're going to have to go like down a dark hallway and everything go to your bedroom and you just there's no turning back you just almost want to stay in the living room all night because the later it gets the worse it gets and you just you know what I mean like everything just seems really creepy you know um, <clears throat> this movie in particular one of the things that really disturbed me was not only the masses of zombies. It was the first time I'd ever seen a movie where there was like the streets were covered, you know, that kind of thing. They were just everywhere. Uh, but it was also the first time I'd seen a movie where you think you had fixed the problem and it actually spread. Um, I don't want to give away too much. And I mean, what I'm telling you here would almost be like a spoiler. So if you haven't seen this movie yet, you might want to skip ahead just a little bit. But for you guys that have, the part I'm talking about is what they do is they burn some of the zombies and when they do it in essence you know what I mean like it just helps it spread I don't know how to describe it but uh, it's one of those weird things where in the world of Return of the Living Dead that's that's one of the things you know what I mean um, I don't know it, it's just it's very bizarre that this movie here in particular like the uh, like tar man or whatever his name was the tar zombie that guy really freaked me out when I was younger which I was pretty young when I saw this I actually remember when it came out seeing the movie poster for this which isn't like this cover it's the other color the other cover that has like the uh, the punk rock zombies and everything I remember seeing that in an old movie theater when I was a kid, that poster at the entrance. It really, really freaked me out. Uh, the next movie I want to talk about <clears throat> is a movie that um, probably is one that almost everybody has seen. And there's aspects of it that are better than others, but it's really still popular. And that is Hellraiser. This is just that one box set that actually has a couple of movies in it, you know, that uh, has the puzzle box. Um... Hellraiser in particular is kind of a unique movie because in hindsight, like several sequels down the road, when you're looking back at Hellraiser 1, you're thinking about uh, the Cenobites, which are like the demon, you know, these like tortured souls that become demons or whatever. The Cenobites themselves seem like they're the villains. But when you go back and see Hellraiser 1, that, that's actually kind of a small part of the story. There's so much more to this. So Hellraiser 1 is always one of those movies that it spooked me when I was a kid, but it spooked me because the parts about the Cenobites uh, come later. You know what I mean? Like you're so caught up in the creepiness of this other stuff. And then the Cenobites uh, show up and it's it's like it's too much, you know, and I was pretty young when I saw this, too, because I saw this when it very, very first came out on VHS. I, we went and rented it like either the second or third day it was out. Uh, the next one is, of course, The Thing, which is always on a lot of my top lists uh, for uh, 80s horror. And um, it's one of those movies that um, I, I put it among my favorite movies in general. I've always really liked this movie, and I like it for the same reason that Travis said he liked American Werewolf in London, which is the transformations and all the different special effects uh, that aren't CG. They are amazing, and they are not with camera tricks. They are in broad daylight, like everything's in focus. It's right there on the screen. Uh, and those are the kind of effects where they work or they don't work, you're, you're going to see them. And so luckily for, you know, everybody that enjoys this movie, it does work. But uh, what I was going to say is Travis had put in his list Poltergeist. 
And my story on this is when I was very, very small. If you can imagine how small I was, it was when this movie very first came to HBO, which I would have guessed would have been about 1984, something like that. I was pretty young. Um, maybe 1983. I don't know how long it used to take movies to get to like HBO. But um, I was really young. I would say, you know, elementary school, way too young to be watching something like this. I was under 10 years old. And um, they did a double feature of this and Poltergeist, and it just fried me. Those two movies together, and I don't even know how I made it through it because I would watch them for a while and I would kind of try to ignore it like I had other things going on. But I was in the room with the TV like right here, <laughs> like right next to me. So it's like you couldn't get too far away from it. And, you know, other people were watching it, so I didn't really want to leave because I wanted to be where everybody was at because it was spooking me. But, uh, yeah, the thing just like, and I, and it created kind of like a love affair that I have with that movie because as much as I was afraid of it, I was intrigued by it and I would revisit it ever so many years and it just becomes a little bit more tolerable, a little bit more tolerable. And then by the time I was like in junior high, I just loved it. You know what I mean? But it took several viewings of me being really spooked by that movie. Uh, this is one, this right here towards the end, that some people don't like. Some people don't think it's scary. And to me, it's one of those movies that really still gets underneath my skin. It's it's the only one in the list I just showed you that really bothers me. And it's kind of hard to say why. I don't know. Uh, because I know what's going to happen and I know all the, you know, like the, the sudden moments. Uh, but still... And uh, that, and I've just got to do this little Kubrick book here, though. But it's uh, The Shining. Um, I know a lot of people are Stephen King fans, and they prefer the book over the movie. And I know that some people are Kubrick fans, and they like this over the book. And I, I'm not really gonna, you know, debate what's better out of the two because um, the book might have been better, uh, you know, as far as what the story was. But I really like what Kubrick did, and uh, it's. It's very eerie, and there's lots of moments in there that go unexplained, which almost pay off better if you hadn't read the book. Because if you read the book and you know some of those things, it, it doesn't really have the same effect as just using your imagination to try to fill in the blanks and not finding an answer. Just having your imagination run wild, um, which is always kind of an interesting thing. Anytime you have a movie where answers go, you know, for answers for questions, just just never come. Uh, it always builds such a fascination to see that movie again, to try to pick up some kind of clues to figure out what's going on, just to just to occupy your mind with that story over and over again. It just starts to, you know, build on your consciousness. And The Shining has that effect on me. Um, I had seen that movie first when I was very young, and I just saw it in passing. I didn't really watch it. Uh, in fact, I sat, I think, during the in front of the TV during a time when it wasn't scary. There was just a big, long, dull moment. And I remember being warned that it was too scary for me and I had to leave the room. And that's where it began because my imagination was making that movie into uh, so much more than it was because I just couldn't conceive of how scary something could be when I was that age. And then later I watched it didn't really pick up on everything. I wasn't quite old enough to understand all the little nuances of the dialogue and everything. And just the psychology of it, you know, starts to build. And so the, by the time I got to like junior high and high school, I mean, you know, that movie had taken on a completely different role. And then I think for the first time when I was like 16 or 17, I watched that movie by myself at home. And it literally unnerved me. Um, I don't know what it was about that particular um, movie taking on a whole different role in my collection of VHS tapes. But I went from like, oh, I was so proud that I had this movie. I'd bought it on VHS, you know, and I was trying to build my video collection there in the, uh, the late 80s and early 90s. And then all of a sudden it was like, this was the Redhead Stepchild tape. I had it at the very end. I never watched it hardly. It just like the idea of watching it all of a sudden had spooked me. And it took me a couple of years before I got that, you know, back into that movie because I think I was a little surprised 
how much more that movie would affect me as I got older. Instead of being the other way around, most movies start to dwindle. You know what I mean? Like the anticipation for all the scares have gone away. You know where it's going to be. You've let it kind of linger. And by the time you see the movie, um, you've kind of taken all the, the gas out of the fire. But uh, a movie like The Shining, it's the music, it's everything, it's the actors, it's the, the bizarreness of it. Um, somehow that movie still has kind of a similar effect to the first time I've seen it, even on numerous uh, viewings. So that's it. I hope this wasn't too long. I'm sure this is like 15, 16 minutes is what it says. I hope you guys enjoyed that. If somebody'd like to tack on five more 80s horror movies that they enjoyed, if you can come up with some that are different than what I've got, that's what I would prefer to see. Uh, and then, you know, go check out Travis's, see what he had to offer to the movies that he chose. So uh, that's it. I hope you guys enjoy and I will see you again soon with some more stuff. I am definitely working on some things. Take care, guys. I'll see you again next time.